I'm going to be speaking a lot for both of us tonight, so yes. get ready. I'm glad everyone has a drink. Um, but yeah, tonight we're going to be talking about the culture is more than a mindset, right? And so earlier, Elizabeth asked, what do you mean by culture? Is it the German culture? Is it... American culture, and that was an interesting question in the beginning because presenting in Germany, I have to consider the fact that the audience is different and their struggles with culture, inclusion, and diversity is different, so how I, we can hopefully deliver a message that is applicable to everyone. And so, wanted to preface that culture in this context is about life experiences, people's lifestyle, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, and contributions to the tech industry, as we are all in tech or agile, uh, and recognize that everyone comes to the table with very specific attributes, and uh, that, that in itself is diverse. So that's kind of the vein of this entire talk and presentation, talking about different cultures, how to be inclusive and diverse. As was already stated, I'm Ash Coleman. This is my naked cat. Her name is Bijou. She's lovely. Um, but yes, I'm a tester. I'm a DNI. Okay, I have a hard time with this word, but I'm going to say <laughs> we it. We practice this. Aficionado. There you go. Yes? Well okay, yes. aficionado, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm a speaker and I am a former chef. I was a chef for 16 years before I changed my life and went into tech. I don't know if that's for the good or for the worst, but I'm here now, so I'll take it. What about me? So, my name's Keith. Uh, I do a lot of conference talking, obviously, so you might know my background, but my perspective on this is having spent the last 20 odd years in large enterprise technology uh, departments, been involved in countless diversity and inclusion panels, uh, run some programs through nonprofits, and my perspective on this is what I've seen kind of working from a program perspective and what hasn't worked as a program perspective and kind of share you know, my experience as a you know, male ally or whatever we want to call it these days um, to just be helpful and, and what has worked and not worked in the various kind of corporate and enterprise uh, contexts that I've been in. Awesome, yes. Uh, and as you see here, Keith is hugging his lovely child. <laughs> Definitely not a cat, but we'll work with it. Yes. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So, yes, Keith and I were talking, both of our experiences come from very different places. And so we took a lot of time thinking and talking about how we were going to make this talk relevant in the way that his experience, like he just explained, is more so on the business side. And mine comes from more of an experiential experience. And so that did start a number of years ago after the 16 years of being a chef, coming into the tech industry and recognizing there wasn't much space for me here. And it was a very difficult idea to think about because I was like, I really like testing, I really like tech, how do I fit in? And spent a long time really diving in and creating space for myself by digging little niches that I really fit into. And it wasn't just about the item of tech that was a difficult thing to find identity with, it was also the fact that companies who were tech companies are difficult to get into and stay at because I'm very different than most people who were in tech at the time that I entered it. So that's kind of what we're gonna touch on today. Beginning with the problem, these guys. <laughs> these guys are the problem, right? Well, <laughs> and scene. They're not necessarily the problem, this is just a joke, but they're not necessarily the problem, but the real problem is kind of the ideas of where tech culture has come from. And it's kind of an aged idea that has permeated the entirety of most tech companies and made very little space for people who don't necessarily look like this. Mm -hmm. These beautiful faces. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so grumpy. Yes. So, being part of the problem, right, the problem looks like me, right? It looks like Paul, it looks like Martin. And having been in, again, corporate change programs and diversity problems, a big part of what I've seen is something you have to get your head around is one, you know, change is hard, right? I mean, I've run a lot of kind of technology change programs, implementing new systems, kind of changing the way we do testing, and that's hard in and of itself. But then when you're starting to talk about cultural change that's not related to technology, you're adding in a whole other level of complexity that people just in their personal lives can't get their head wrapped around. And if you're not ready to come to the place where you say, you know, I'm racist, right? I'm sexist. I don't even know how I'm, these, these things are benefiting from me. I haven't even been you know, introspective enough to really 
understand you know, all the different cultural and societal ways that I benefit from a system that a lot of people are, are either inhibited or locked out from, you're asking people to change their hiring practices and they haven't really gone through that, that journey yet. Um, so that makes it twice as hard really. And as well, there's lots of stuff just from social stigmatisms that people don't want to change their minds. Forget about all the other psychology around, um, you know, cultural biases and ingrained biases. The other big issue that we have with these programs is they don't work, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm not going to go into the top 50 U.S. companies who spend, you want, it, it's phenomenal amount of money, I'll give you some figures in a second, on diversity and inclusion programs. And I'll just pick on Google, because if you take the top 50 companies in the U.S. over the last three years, they haven't even moved the needle. Right, it hasn't changed at all. And in fact, the numbers for women in tech are going down. Right, but if we just take Google for an example, from the last three years, 2014 through to 2017, um, they have spent roughly 300 odd million dollars on diversity and inclusion programs. And what do you think the number in percentage increase change was in their diversity numbers? Negative. <laughs> 1% increase which accounts to about 600 hires over three years. It's absolutely pathetic, you know, because those programs don't work. And in my experience, the reason why they don't work is there's a lot of structural issues in how you bring people into an organization that are just natural barriers, let alone, for, for different people, let alone associated to some kind of diversity target, you know, workforce development program, those folks never get into the pipeline. You've got issues around um, recruitment where there's, I, again, having worked in these, in these departments, the universities have relationships with our recruiters and you'll never, forget about trying to get into those schools, you'll never, your resume will never come across my desk. So there's competition, natural competition within organizations that prevent that from happening. Um, and frankly, one of the backlashes that's happening, as you can read about right now in a lot of these organizations, is now when you're bringing people in, they're having them sign you know, uh, non-binding arbitration agreements so they won't join a, non, uh, a class action lawsuit. That's a, a new add-on to a lot of the, your new hire programs, right? They're asking people to sign non-disclosure agreements if there are any issues in the workplace. And it's not very principled management. Um, so, and the last piece that I know from my personal experience, um, and, and you know, Angie can attest to uh, one of our great hires that we had through a workforce development program, works with her out on Twitter right now, kid who came through the Prescolas program, is that there really is no skills gap, right? I just say when working with Prescolas that, you know, we, it wasn't a skills gap, it was a will gap. There are people there that have the talent to do the job, we're just not looking for them, and there's lots of stuff in place to stop that from happening. Right. So I'm going to dive in a little bit on what Keith just said from the perspective that I'm coming from, and that's as someone who was trying to get my resume on a desk like his, right? This becomes a problem for many reasons, more specifically becomes the major problem for people like myself because we don't have an entry into these types of companies that are known for their technology and their ability to advance people in their craft, right? He spoke a little bit about the pipeline, and the pipeline is a funny thing because everywhere you look when you're talking about diversity and inclusion, you hear the words, pipeline is not, a or we have a pipeline issue, right? What is a pipeline issue? To be quite honest, it's not a thing. From his experience with Perscolis, the skills are the same. So what is happening within that pipeline that is having such an issue getting people like myself on the desks of people like him? And what is happening is we're not looking in the right places for these candidates, right? Perscolis is a system that's created for underrepresented people to enter this field. How many of those programs actually exist? Not enough to be making moves on the amount of women, people of color, LBGTQ, and diverse persons, non-binary inclusive, that are getting jobs in the tech industry based on their differences, right? We don't have the opportunity to get 
to these places if people aren't looking where we are. And so when you, people say there's a pipeline issue, what they're really telling you is that we're not working hard enough or that our scope isn't broad enough to be able to see people like myself. And that is problematic because even if you make it, the likelihood of you sticking around is going to be very low because you don't find identity in those places. Another thing, though, is incentive programs. Incentive programs, they're putting a lot of emphasis on getting people there not enough emphasis on keeping them there. And so you'll see higher numbers go up, and you'll see people present at companies, but the likelihood of them staying is very low. Turnover is about a year versus two to five years for tech, and people are having a difficult time saying, we have these standing numbers for diversity within our organizations that actually shows year after year after year. They're not putting the right emphasis on these incentive programs to keep people there. They're mostly concerned with getting them in the building. And then management principles, HR. Something I always want to note about HR. HR is in the business of the business. It's not in the business of the people. And they're an organization that's there that talk about, yeah, come to us with your issues and let's discuss these things. But from personal experience that I've had, the last thing that they want to do is stir the pot for the majority in light of the minority. And so we've seen issues like this happen more recently and handled in whatever, you know, whatever your own opinion about the way it was handled is concerned, but James Damore at Google, right? So this huge document went out, stirred the pot, people were feeling a type of way, actions were taken, and people have different responses on what actually occurred and whether it was fair or not. That conversation continues to happen in organizations, recognizing whether it's the way to go or whether they need to recognize more minorities in this situation in this case, it was women, or then for the majority, which in tech and in most companies is men. So what is going on? I want to talk a little bit about where we are in all of this and why it's important, right? So we see that there are issues, and they're recognized issues. We see that there are lower numbers. Statistics are showing us all these things. Women aren't staying. People of color aren't staying or even entering the business. All of this stuff is very evident at this point. And so what we've seen happen since this has occurred is things like all of these lovely buzzwords I'm going to use right now and then define them so that we understand where we stand with our organizations with them. The belief in diversity, right? So something interesting has happened over the last few years when talking about diversity. People love to talk about diversity, and they throw it around like they have a true belief in it. But the reality is that their initiatives do not support that belief. They like saying things like, we're an open organization for women, we value people of color, we love opinions, we love difference, all of these things. But then when you actually look at their systems, they don't support supporting these people. And so this belief in diversity is nothing more than lip service, right? They're just basically talking about how awesome it would be if they could fend for their own identity within the community, saying, oh, we're diverse people here at this organization. We have what it takes to be considered diverse because we talk about it. But here's the real thing, are they being about it? And the answer is likely no. Another thing is diversity swag. So this is where you start getting the things that are internalized, right? You have the code of conducts, you have the unconscious bias trainings, you have the structured NDAs that have language around the onboarding process talking about diversity. We promote to women and we have these opportunities with girls who code or you know, any other meetup or group that is specific to people of color, women, LBGTQ, non-binary, diverse groups, right? But then it's what is happening with those. What I found is that a lot of companies that instate an unconscious bias training in their company don't require it. So most companies at this time require sexual harassment training, which is a big deal. But sexual harassment actually falls below items of race and gender when it comes to legalities. So why are we putting emphasis on sexual harassment and not items of not unconscious bias training? That's swag. It says, we have this in place, but if we're not making it required, then we don't care enough about it for other people to understand what that means. That's a problem. And then diversity of thought, this is another fun one. So not to keep coming back to James D, but also to come back to James D. I'm not even gonna use his whole name, because you know. <laughs> but yes, coming back to it, one of the things that was emphasized was that diversity of thought, right? It's like, okay, well, we might look the same, but we all have different thoughts and feelings. As true as that is, when you're talking about diversity, as I phrased in the beginning, we're talking about 
cultures of people, socioeconomic backgrounds, and all of these other items that actually require other people from different circumstances to be present in the same room to promote that sort of behavior. If you're just focused on the diversity of thought, it's kind of a cop-out to really understanding what diversity means within your organization. Then you're just assuming that if you hire someone from Yale and from Harvard and from Columbia, that they're going to have different thoughts because they were taught from different professors. But the reality is, is that they still likely have a very similar background that's not really promoting that difference in socioeconomic background or lifestyle. It might, but the chances of that happening are very low. Promoting diversity of persons first will bring about a diversity of thought that really helps fortify the company's ability to be inclusive. Another thing that we're noticing is backlash, and I want to really point this one out because a lot of stuff is happening in the public with the ability to call things out. Now, all y'all might know I'm a little savage, so hold on to your beers as I talk real intense about this one. This is that empowerment to be able to say something is amiss, right? So now we're getting a lot of people saying, this is what's going on, this is what's going on, this is what's going on. I had this happen, this is what's going on here, and then nothing happens. There's a lot of attention towards these issues, but what are the actual actions that are happening to help them out, right? And so promoting an area and an environment of safety as well as of openness Yes, come and talk about your issues, but how are we going to move forward from that? And we'll get to that in a little bit. But just wanted to throw that out there so we have that note to talk about later. Overall, this is about the mindset, right? So we're all in this mindset where there is something the matter. Something's the matter. We don't see any changes in our organizations. The numbers don't change year after year after year. So we're wondering, what do we need to do about this? And so we're going to talk about that. Right. So... The first one there, and I'm not gonna, we're gonna put the tech bro culture to one side, and I'm just gonna talk to hopefully the folks that can listen or hear what I'm about to say. If you, in my experience, if you wanna be a good male ally, shut up. <laughs> right? Did you see what I've been doing for the last 15 minutes up here? <laughs> I'll give him a treat later. Stop. Just kidding. Talking. Stop talking until you have reflected and understand what people are trying to say, right? People aren't asking you to fix something, right? Just listen. Step two, listen and really hear what people are saying. And until you've stopped talking long enough and listened to what people are saying and done some research and understand how to approach a situation, then you're probably able to start engaging in conversations or at least be able to act appropriately in, in, in certain situations. I'll give you an example of what happened even here. Uh, this, this week at a you know, fairly safe uh, place to be, there was some behavior that I was witnessing from some, uh, a certain someone, and he was getting incredibly aggressive towards uh, a woman who was speaking here as well. And I let it go for a little bit because this person doesn't need my help arguing. Um, but it got a little too far to one side, so I could have barreled in there and done something, you know, irrational, but instead I grabbed the person by the shoulder, we separated, had a chat afterwards, made sure everything was calmed down, but it, even here in a very safe, safe environment where we've got a code of conduct, there's still examples where, you know, knowing how to navigate that is incredibly helpful. So, you know, my advice, right, is just stop trying to stick your beak in where you're not really sure how that's going to go, right? Right. Right. I'm just kidding. Um, and so that brings up a really good point about accountability, right? So transparency and accountability is the next thing I'm going to talk about. One is recognizing where we stand. I'm going to talk about two aspects of transparency and accountability. It's going to be a personal note as well as a business note. On a personal note, we show up, and the reality is, is that we all have unconscious bias, no matter who you are. I have unconscious bias. I have unconscious bias towards many different things, mostly because I don't have that life experience. And so this is something that we fall back on when we're making decisions or when we're reacting to certain circumstances. We fall back on what's natural to us, how we've been conditioned growing up. And so it's very important to have that understanding about yourself 
knowing that when you enter a diverse environment, that sometimes you're going to meet people who aren't where you are, right? They're just from a different circumstance as you. So you can't account for their life experience to be the same reaction that you would anticipate if someone were to do something to you. And then having accountability for that. In those instances where we do sidestep and actually do something wrong, how are we responding to that? This is where that empathy card comes in that I'm going to talk about a little bit more later. But expressing empathy towards these situations, knowing, again, you have your own biases. And so if something were to happen to you, how do you respond in that situation? Do you react? Which is 100% fine. Reaction is fine and it's natural. But then how do we take accountability for those actions thereafter? And so just recognizing that very personal aspect of transparency and accountability. Now, as far as business is concerned, this one's an even more difficult situation to think about because finding accountability within an organization for diversity is difficult because we already talked about HR and their interest being with the business rather than the people. But you can take it to your company and absolutely exercise these things there. One, transparency is recognizing who you're working with like, and who's around you. One of the things that we're going to find or that you'll find as you look into diversity and inclusion is that a lot of companies are straying away from the ideas about numbers. They don't want to know how many women versus men there are. They don't want to know how many LBGTQ there are or how many people of color there are because we're not focused on numbers. That's the major quote that they'll say. Can we do this without focusing on the numbers? The answer that's no. How do you know to, where to go if you don't know where you're from, right? And so it's not necessarily saying we need to meet a specific metric, but it's being transparent and saying, you know what? There's 20% women in this room when there likely should be at least 40. Good start, right? And of course, every different role requires or has the opportunity for different diversity. But it's actually giving a good look at where you're at at work and saying, you know, I feel like we could use a little bit more diversity in gender or in race or socioeconomic background or sexual preference or whatever the situation is that you're not seeing represented at your organization. And being accountable for that. So what does that mean? Some of the things that I'm going to lead in for Keith to talk about happen with the company taking action moving forward. But again, it starts with us. I think that we forget sometimes how visible we are at our organizations when we're on the ground. We might not be in that position where we're, we're an executive, but we definitely have some say in asking for things to, to support us in our work, right? We might say something like, oh my goodness, we don't have enough water in the kitchen, and the next thing you know, more water bottles show up, right? I'm sure some of us have played around with that before getting more post-its or more highlighters. Now, this one's a little more difficult because you're talking about people here, so I don't want to dumb them down to post-its, but quite honestly, it's the same situation. I know personally that I've done it, sometimes with success, sometimes not, but I definitely have said, you know what, this would be a lot easier if I had more women in this meeting. And not saying it to be abusive to the system, just saying it like, hey, listen, our users, are mostly women, so I'm wondering why I'm the only woman in this meeting talking about these specific deliverables that are going to serve women. That's a hard conversation to drive, being the only woman present, and quite honestly, the end point is usually not serving women the way that it could if more voices were female or those who identify with being female were in the room. Yeah, no? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so just to, just, to piggy, <laughs> just to piggyback off of something that Ash was just saying, there's a really good uh, report that Morgan Stanley put out a couple years ago on the uh, business performance of diversity. And for anybody who might be trying to tell you that the jury's still out on whether or not diversity adds to the bottom line, they did a very intense and detailed study on this. And the jury is not out anymore. I mean, they are at or overperforming uh, companies in their same brackets in the S&P 500. And so diversity, absolutely, there's a business case to be made for diversity. So don't let anybody tell you that. And the other thing that I'm particularly passionate about is changing the HR and recruitment culture. I've worked with about six kind of large organizations. And a big shift that you can really make a difference in is moving your workforce development programs out of your corporate social responsibility 
bucket and put it into a real budget in your operating expenses so that it's adding it as a pipeline in a real sense, not through nonprofits. People get funneled through different ways. It also actually adds a lot of stigma to people who have come through those programs and get hired into the organization. If it wasn't in the corporate social responsibility or nonprofit arm of the, of the, the bank or insurance company or whoever's investing in that, moving those programs from partnerships into actual real departments would have a huge impact, um, not just on the pipeline, but the, for the people who come through them. Awesome, yeah. Something that I want to re-emphasize is the budget, right? So we talk about actionables within our own orgs. How much do they want it? And most times, businesses underestimate the amount of effort, money, and time it takes to build these environments, right? They sit there and think, okay, we'll just get people in the pipeline and then it'll resolve itself. But something I want to jump to is retention, right? So I've mentioned before, sometimes I just don't want to stay at organizations because I don't see myself there. And it's not I don't see myself there as in being a black woman, I don't see myself there as in receiving the respect or having the ability to be able to build a career in that particular environment. Some numbers that hit us often are how often women are promoted, how often people of color are hired, how often people within the LBGTQ community are represented in organizations. These are real statistics that are actually driving this item of retention, and it only takes recognizing it and then moving towards that effort of retaining those people to get that done. Now, retention looks something like representation, of course, but also it looks like career trajectory, right? How am I supposed to be successful if I'm not able to be promoted or if I don't get into those meetings that I need to or I don't get those continual learning stipends to get me to conferences like this one, right? How successful am I gonna be there? And you start have to think about that in sponsorship. Are we promoting sponsorship of people who might not have that opportunity regularly presented to them? Another item of diversity that I've talked about that Elizabeth Segroba talks about often is personality types, right? Being an introvert. What if I don't speak up for myself? Which is a common characteristic of women, not always, but it's something that does go into the statistics of looking at what women retention looks like. Are we advocating for those people who are genuinely doing a good job, or are we advocating for those who speak up, right? Squeaky will gets the oil type situation. Where do we stand with keeping people there that are having a difficult time even getting in the door? Do we have programs set up for them to be successful? And if we don't, then that's something we need to apply that time, that energy, that money into to make sure that we're getting that for them. And the last bit is education. Again, education knowledge is power, right? We sit there and we talk about all the things that we know every day and we contribute to the companies that we work for with that very knowledge. One of the things that gets behind in this particular situation is our knowledge about people. We're at an Agile conference also, which talks a lot about people, right? We have applied a lot of training into this as well as worked with a lot of organizations in order to make a more cohesive work environment. Now, if we threw the same ideas around a cohesive work environment into diversity, we'll find that we're paying more attention to that contribution as well. We're educating ourselves to understand how to keep people who are not like us, how to keep a more diverse environment going, how to retain people in these companies and organizations, right? And then we can actually start seeing those numbers move. But this is a bigger job, easier said than done, right? But these are just some ideas to get us started. And so I'm going to close because I want to leave some time for questions. But I want to close in talking about the bottom line here. And Keith allowed me to do the closing because this is now my talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the bottom line is that we need an inclusion mindset, right? So there's a lot of talk again about diversity and inclusion and culture, community, all of this stuff without having the real meat of what this means. Inclusion is breaking down the blocks, debilitating specific individuals from reaching the things that they need to be successful, right? It's enabling them to be able to have success. We need to have this mindset throughout all the things that we're doing at work, whether it's our small influence by requesting more something at work, or being participants in DNI efforts that are going on within our organization. But also, it starts with us where we're being accountable for ourselves in the way that we present opportunities to just encounter those who are diverse. Right? I'm not even gonna get into statistics about friends and people of color and all that sort of stuff, but I'm sure you've seen your fair bit on Twitter. 
But yeah, reaching out there and recognizing like, this might not be represented here. I might have an unconscious bias preventing me from seeing what I need to see. Can I stop and listen? Can I stop and just be an ally? Can I be present for this conversation? Can I just be myself? And that's the biggest one. I personally want to show up to work and be myself. I know that's a hard thing to think about, but want to show up and be myself and have fun like everyone else does. And so am I working for an organization that recognizes this or am I working at a place that I feel like I need to hide who I genuinely am in order to feel included? And the hope is that the answer is no. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> they gave. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and have some questions. Anne so I'm going to give me this a prop to uh, Q and A. So. <laughs> Go for it. So you, wait, sorry. you mentioned empathy, that you will elaborate a little bit more on it. Absolutely. But I failed to capture the empathy highlight that was supposed to follow. No, that's a good note. Thank you. So <laughs> if you didn't, oh, you had the mic. So empathy, right? So empathy is a core value at the current company that I work at, and it's something that drives a lot of the work that I do in the DNI space. And I've explained it to a number of people when they come seeking coaching for diversity and inclusion with the, the, the same ideas about unconscious bias. Like I've stated before, I personally have my own unconscious biases, and so if I were to approach every situation coming from my own perspective, then the likelihood of me being understood by other people is very low. Empathy is that ability to take a step back and be objective about a situation and then approach it with a more calculated approach, right? So going back and saying, okay, I hear what you're saying. I understand how you feel. I might not resonate with those feelings or even those thoughts, but I'm going to go ahead and assume good intent here and say, let's find a solution together. And I think that that kind of encompasses empathy. Yes. And, and for me, as somebody who's, you couldn't come up with an advantage that I haven't benefited from as a, you know, middle-aged white dude in tech from America, right? No problem. So, but what's, what's really been instructive for me is you, if that's all the, you know, I, it's almost become buzzword, but say privilege that you have, the onus is on you to go and explore the world. It's not, it's not, it's so easy to go back to sleep and just ignore it. And that's really kind of the whole point of privilege, isn't it? Is that I don't have to think about it, right? So I have to force myself actively, my kids, my boys, we have to go and find out what's happening to other people in their lives so we can develop some empathy for them when we find ourselves in those situations. The onus is on you to do it, right. not for other people to train it into you. And that was such a juicy answer. I really want to dive in a little bit. I recognize there's more <laughs> questions. But I, just to say really quickly, uh, the onus of the issue is not on the oppressed, right? And I'm just going to say that. We can talk about it later if you have more questions, but it is our accountability that should be leading this effort of empathy. You shouldn't rely on other people to provide all the answers for you because they've already been living in an existence that makes them have to do the extra work of trying to fit in. Asking them on top of that to explain why you should care is not the way that this equation works. So the onus should not be on the person or the peoples who are oppressed. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, in my first tech job, I was the only girl the young, and the youngest in a team of 10. And there was a lot of um, jokes that made me feel a bit uncomfortable, not directed at anyone in particular, but just generally the, the culture and the way people talked. But I felt really insecure about like speaking up and saying they made me feel uncomfortable because that was the only team I wanted to be part of it. Have you ever dealt with a situation like that and how did Absolutely. you deal with it? Absolutely. Do you mind if I take this one, Keith? I know you've been the uh, <laughs> only girl in an organization before, but sure, go ahead. I'm going to take I, I've this. I've got some thoughts on it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so yes, actually my first tech job, I was the only woman of 13, right? And it was the same situation. Very brute environment, not very nice. In fact, all the devs were really mean to me. Um, but since that experience, something that I like to implement is knowledge is power, that whole idea again, where I would, uh, 
I'm going to take a step back real quick and talk about a book that I read recently. Uh, it's called Radical Candor. And it talks about how there's a graph that talks about the feedback loop, right, and how we can get in on that. Now, the idea about it is that the more intense the feedback, the higher the emotion needs to be in that situation. Something to note, women have to go higher on that emotional part of the graph in order to deliver hard feedback. And so this is that extra work that we have to do that unfortunately sometimes just does need to be done for our own sake. But I started throwing um, articles out there, kind of just like talking about workplace divert, not being any sort, of, not being a stab at any particular person, but just saying like, oh, I have you know this this interest and this is something that I shared with the group in Slack or something. Or at that time, I don't know if we we're using Slack, but anyways, using some sort of. of medium to communicate some of the things that I didn't personally feel comfortable saying. And eventually those who kind of caught on, we started having conversations about it and it was this permeation of ideas that just kind of fled through talking about, oh, well maybe Ash feels a little bit, you know, outside in this situation, so. Well, I was gonna say, and I've said this for a long time that the, you're not gonna fix the diversity issues in technology until you fix the asshole problems in technology, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that, what, that just exacerbates everything else. And as somebody, I grew up working in my uh, investment banks, which is like the last bastion of just the horrible behavior, you know, I mean, that's just allowed. And they're just, you know, in my experience anyway, and, there, and I've been witness to bad behavior and said nothing. I've been witness to bad behavior and said, and said something. And I think that's something as well that the, the onus is on us as men in tech to start policing that behavior. We can't wait until somebody gets found out before we start saying something about that. And I, I think that's the frustration for me, not to detract in any way from the stories women are telling, but that it's all reactionary, and that's just got to stop. We've got to start being proactive about policing our own behavior. And it starts with the stupid joke you let go, the, all that stuff. You've got to just start nipping that in the bud because it just, it just builds from there. No more locker room talk. <laughs> I know the Americans got that one. Sorry. Just gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, I was the only woman uh, in team of 15 as well, uh, but in the same time it took uh, me a long time to understand that I'm privileged as well. I'm then white, what? I'm privileged as well. <laughs> I'm white, I look European, I have a name which looks normal uh, in German. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, um, and I, I'm very uh, happy to see so many faces and so many people here, but uh, do you have some tips to understand for others, uh, just that they notice that they are privileged as well? Yeah. Because it's, uh, it's not, okay, you are privileged, not me, because mm -hmm. that that's shifts that uh, way, and I think this is extremely important to understand, yes, I'm privileged. Right. Yeah, this, that's actually a really great question. And this is a narrative that's very difficult for people to comprehend, especially when they're in a discriminated party. So I'm going to use women as the example here, but it happens in levels regardless of where you stand in this item of privilege. So women have the idea that all women have the same experiences. But what about me? I'm a black woman. So not only do I have the black experience, I have the woman experience, which in statistics takes me from here on the women's scale actually down to here, right? So how do I show up and convince other women that, hey, while you're fighting for 76 cents to be a dollar to the white male, I'm fighting for 53 cents to get to a dollar, right? And this is what you call intersectionality. This is a whole other talk, so I'm not gonna get terribly into it, but the tips I would have is, again, expressing that empathy. If you are in a place and have the desire to share, share those stories. A lot more people than you think will resonate with them, and it's not gonna solve your problems immediately, but the hope is that it builds enough empathy within your situation 
to start building allies, right? This is all about allyship. Whether you're a participant that's maybe privileged, you can be an ally for someone who's not. And so even within the women's circle or the feminist circle, women need allies. We can't just sit there and assume that every woman is discriminated upon in the same way because they're all women. And we must understand that women is a very diverse group as well that has different conditions associated with being under the umbrella of woman. Yeah. More questions? So. Hi. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, I come from a company that is called Rangle.io in Canada. Mm -hmm. and we put into place a diversity program. And it started with a guild called the Diversity Guild. Mm -hmm. And one of the first steps we took is pretty much what you said, uh, to know where we were to get the numbers. Um, we, pro we started providing information to all the organization and and to, to make uh, everyone understand what we wanted to do. And we created an anonymous survey that asses, you know, gender, sexuality, etc. But there was a barrier, like no everyone uh, answered the survey. So it was one of the issues that we had uh, uh, trying to, to collect the numbers. Mm -hmm. So what would you do to, to, to break that, bar to go over that barrier? Sure, do you have any input on that? Yeah, I, 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 well, my, my thought would be like what we were talking about earlier, that that first step of, hey! <laughs> <laughs> that, that first step of kind of the self-evaluation, because I, I think part of that, there's a cosmetic layer to these kind of corporate diversity programs, and you, know, you can be your own diversity program, right? You know, I, I, to kind of quote, you know, my president Barack Obama, you know, be the change you want to see in the world, right? You know what I mean? Be the change you want to see. You don't have to participate in a corporate program to learn about stuff. And once, you know, once you get woken up, you know, stay woken up, you know what I mean? Don't slip back in, you know, and be the change that you, you want to see in the world. The diversity program, statistically, it's not going to work. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not. So you have to be that change. You know, you can participate in it, but all the real meaningful lasting change is going to come from you out the other side of that being a better human being. Also, see me afterwards. I know we're running out of time because I've got some other things for you too. Hi. Awesome talk. Oh, thank you. Love to. Cute. Um, awesome talk. As... Uh, <laughs> As, um, as someone who sort of, uh, so I, first of all, um, I'm going to have to apologize. I'm going to have to ask you to, uh, you know, do that little extra lifting to make me realize something. So apologies for that. But at the same point, um, as someone who organizes a regular meetup, which is trying to reach uh, a more diverse range of people, um, what you've talked about uh, tonight is very much focused on business. I'm wondering if there are any specific insights or ideas, recommendations around sort of trying to make more diversity in terms of community-driven things and meetups and stuff? Absolutely. So let, let me answer first so then yes. you can have the last word. Go on. for it. All right. Um, so I'm going to chime in on your question even though you weren't looking at me for a second during that question. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi, Keith. Yeah, I'm yeah oh. that was me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right, so, so th this has been, you know, my, my philosophy on this for the last probably three or four years and more, more intensely over the last couple is the, you know, again, kind of growing up through the corporate tech world, it was a lot about mentorship and I'm not, I'd kind of given, I, I don't know how much that works, right? So for me, it's more about sponsorship, right? So fi like finding people and getting them opportunities to speak, putting them up in front, like just because I, I really truly believe, and this is another lesson I learned through the whole Perscolis experience was like visible role models really matter a lot. Because if, if they didn't matter so much, all the men wouldn't lose their fucking minds when a woman was a CEO or something like that, right? So it matters a lot for people to see people who look, just even look like them doing things they want to do. So I would just really focus on sponsorship as that, that's how I found has been the most meaningful thing for me over the last couple of years. Sorry. That was well said. Put your feet on the floor and go find someone. And not to say it's a project, but 
we have friends, we have the ability to make friends. And if you're talking about social events, get out there and be social, right? Help them to see the vision that you see in it, which is likely something that's your passion considering you're really concerned about these numbers. So try and bring other people into it by the same way that we do other things. Go to a bar, make friends, you know, like get on Facebook, do something that provides an opportunity to get people that might not be seen to the events that you want them to be seen at. And support them through it, sponsorship. Yeah, cool. May Thank I say you. something? I, sorry. <laughs> um, um. You have the floor, Jose. <laughs> Um, um, I mean, we, um, we are working on diversity for nine years now for this conference. Yeah? Well, it's hard, okay? It's not easy. Um, if you look at all the uh, lineups that we had, yeah? we have always a majority of women, okay? And I think this is important yeah? to show that we have people here that are very, very good, and they're women. It doesn't matter, we don't care what kind of color, religion, uh, sex, whatever. I don't, we don't care. The important thing is that you talk here. And um, the first step, what we have seen, is um, to get women here. Yeah? The second is to get them there, and then to find a way from there to here. And this is quite difficult. So if you have seen, for example, talking about numbers, we were quite aggressive last year on uh, diversity. We pay a lot of ads in, in Facebook and Twitter and so on to get more women. Yeah? And um, it was crazy because we saw that as soon as we started these ads, the number of registration went down. I don't know if there is a correlation. I don't know it, okay? But this is the society, the society where we are living, okay? So, but we kept. We get, I think, 10, 50% less, but it's okay. This year, the opposite happened. So we have, I don't know if you noticed, but we have a lot of women attending here. Amazing. More than ever. And we're happy. And I hope that when we do the call for papers next year, that each of them send a paper. Yeah? We are fighting. We are fighting since nine years. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. Sorry. <laughs> no, by all means. Um, one of the uh, one last thing, Mark. So, Cassandra talked about being uncomfortable. All of this is going to be uncomfortable. So, when I was talking earlier about being savage about this, it's because the reality of it is that it's going to be uncomfortable. You're not going to feel comfortable walking up to certain people, talking about specific issues, being really passionate, and bringing your emotions to the table most times when you're talking about these issues, because they are very personal. It starts with us. Anticipate the uncomfort, because it means you're learning, right? Going back to those like elementary school rules that mom used to tell us. When you go to school and you're feeling upset and you're sad about a certain situation, someone rejected you or you didn't get your homework in on time, it's because you're uncomfortable recognizing you weren't able to show up the way you wanted. There, after it requires growth. So once you get to that place where you're like, I don't really care about my homework, so whatever, that's growth, and then you're no longer uncomfortable about it, right? So, I mean, maybe that was just me, but uh, yeah. Anyways, was there another question? I don't know. Okay, that's one. Yes, and then we, I have an announcement after that. God, I've got to throw in front of people. There <laughs> you go. You can have hey. the target. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was, that was fantastic. So I guess we've had a few people say, you know, um, they were, they experienced, they were part of a minority, joined a company, and they were the, you know, the, the, the so only So you can one. look at Keith too when you're talking. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Sorry, and I, um, and I guess one of the things, I, so I've been doing a, a little bit of research in this area the last couple of months, and one of the things I've been interested in is the problem of, there are quite a lot of companies now that are just waking up to the fact that they have a problem, and there was a fantastic post by um, oh, Basecamp, and I can't remember the guy's name, um, the guy that owns, that runs Basecamp, but basically saying, they looked around, they suddenly went, hey, you know, we've basically been hiring people just like us for the last, you know, 10 years, and the problem I was wondering is, is there's this thing of, well, so you start, you say, okay, we want to go on hire more women, and we want to go on hire more ethnic minorities. Well, you know what? There's always going to be the first one. Yeah. And that person 
isn't necessarily going to feel that comfortable, regardless of the, uh, the, the positive environment and all of the work you do to make that an, an easy hire. Mm -hmm. How, I don't know if you've worked with companies or been there, that, that, that kind of, from the other side, I guess, from the organization, how do you make that first step without that just being a, a disaster, basically, you know? Right. So I talked about being the service project earlier in the talk, and that's kind of exactly what we're talking about. Unfortunately, there always has to be a first. Yeah. But incentives go a long way. And I'm not saying that in the way of salary or anything like that, but again, this is about opportunities. If you're really getting to know the candidates that you want to incorporate into your organization that are diverse, you're gonna wanna start attracting those sorts of incentives to your company and then advertising them along with your ads for hire. So it's like once that starts happening, people, despite the fact that they might be the first, will recognize, one, diversity is top of mind, and they do want more people who look or are like them. Yeah. But then also, there's a little bit of a buffer with how good the incentives are that helps them recognize, okay, if I work at this company, I will have the opportunity to get someplace, aside from other companies that I might have worked at that I didn't have the same experience. So just being dedicated to that cause and recognizing they are a special person within the org, yeah. but then, and another thing too is, the, the backlash that you received with maybe the registration going down will happen as well. It's the uncomfort of paying special attention to an issue. It's like the all lives matter thing, I won't do it. But um, yeah, just really getting in there and talking about how do we lift up this metric or this person or this individual or this diversity aspect in order to be supportive for their advancement. I was gonna say, make sure they're treated decently Make sure they're given the same opportunities of everybody else, and make sure they're paid the same. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. That's it. That's it.